Stanford University. Okay, everybody. Well, welcome. Welcome back. Hope you all had a good lunch. Um, we're all thrilled to be here with you. We've got an exciting panel on the topic of hydrogen and fuels. And we'll get into what that means in just a moment. Maybe uh, we can go down the line and do some just quick introductions so you can see who's on the panel. I'll be serving as your moderator. My name is Tom or Tomas Jaramillo. I'm in the chemical engineering department here at Stanford. I'm also in the Stanford Door School for Sustainability in the Energy Science Engineering Department. I also have an appointment in Photon Science up at SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. I serve as the director of a center called SUNCAT, the SUNCAT Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. We're all about catalysis, energy, and sustainability. Let me pass the baton and have each of our panelists introduce themselves. Joanna, why don't you go next? So I'm Johanna Nelson Wacker. Um, I am a lead scientist at SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, that is a school of Stanford, um, and it is just up the hill on Monte Hill Road. And um, there I uh, run a research team that looks at energy materials, and we use x-rays to characterize these materials. So we have a, a synchrotron, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, and um, we can use those high-powered x-rays to um, look at materials. Outstanding, Mateo. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Matteo Carniello. I'm an associate professor in chemical engineering here at Stanford. And uh, just like Tom, uh, we're colleagues uh, on the same floor and also part of the Sanka Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. Uh, I've been here for about 10 years working in the broad area of heterogeneous catalysis, uh, nanostructure materials, more recently working in the area of CO2 capture and conversion. Uh, and uh, look forward to sharing with you some ideas on hydrogen as well. Thank you. Great. Matt? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Cannon. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry here at Stanford, and I, I also serve as the director for the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, my research group is broadly interested in uh, chemistry and engineering challenges related to carbon management and sustainable resource utilization. Um, we have uh, projects in everything spanning from you know, creating new uh, performance advantage sustainable plastics uh, to uh, electrochemical systems for resource recovery to uh, carbon removal chemistry, um, as well as what I'll talk about today, which is heterogeneous catalysis for, uh, for hydrogenation. Wonderful. Tony. Great. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tony Kovsek. I'm a professor of energy science and engineering. And uh, sort of very broadly, my research interests are flow and transport in geological materials. So that is sort of realized as like CO2 storage, hydrogen storage. And we also have emerging interests in uh, natural hydrogen generation. So I'm, I'm the director of the Stanford Center for Carbon Storage, which is also interested in hydrogen storage, as well as uh, something called Sutrie, which is an energy transition research institute uh, that focuses on subsurface uh, applications for sustainability. Excellent. All right. So we're very fortunate to have our four panelists here today representing four very large and different entities at Stanford. We've got the Stanford Door School for Sustainability. We've got the Stanford School of Engineering. We've got Stanford Humanities and Sciences. And we've got SLAC National Accelerator Lab. We're all one-stop shopping on one plot of land that we lovingly call the farm. So we're all very closely connected. I've had a, the pleasure of working together with all four of our panelists over the years. Um, just a representation of a fantastic ecosystem that we get to work in. And very shortly, you'll hear about some of their dynamite research. They've got, they prepared some short talks. Uh, trust me, each one of them could give a dynamite 45-minute colloquium and really dive into it. But I think what we want to do today is have as much time as possible to engage with each and every one of you this precious opportunity to ask any questions that might be on your mind in these spaces. The expertise that I have here to my right is extraordinary. So I want to make sure that you all have a chance to take advantage of that. Um, so before we dive into the first of the four presentations, so what we're going to do is I'll say just a few words to frame the discussion. We'll pass the baton. We'll go down the line. We'll have them each give their talks off of that computer. Uh, no Q&A uh, until everyone's had a chance to share their work. And then we'll open it up and hopefully have lots of time for questions and answers. I have a few kind of starter questions that I thought might be interesting for you all to hear about from the expertise we have. And then we'll open it up to wherever, uh, wherever your hearts desire. So, all right. So to frame the discussion, uh, I just want to speak for a moment about the theme of hydrogen and fuels. What does that mean? And why should we care? 
and just a good moment to remind ourselves that for the entire 20th century, pretty much, and certainly where we are right now in the 21st century and looking forward perhaps decades ahead, chemical fuels are the primary form of energy that we as human beings utilize across this earth to the tune of about 80% of global energy. And naturally, we know where that comes from. It comes from underground, right? It comes from coal, it comes from oil, it comes from natural gas. And thanks to amazing people over many, many decades, and in fact, centuries, building up the scientific foundations as well as the engineering and the applications, we're able to get these resources and transform them into very usable products, whether it's jet fuel or diesel or gasoline or lubricants or plastics, building materials, et cetera. These are extraordinary processes that allow for a high quality of life. Uh, we do recognize, though, that uh, there are some challenges there. Sustainability is certainly one of them. Um, equity is another. While billions of us on Earth, including everybody in this room, can leverage those technologies, not everybody has equal access. So it's really an opportunity to think, what's the role of fuels in the future? And there are some open questions. Uh, what should those fuels be? Should they be hydrocarbons, which is, of course, the predominant form of energy that we use across the globe or something else? What would the feedstock be? What would the chemical process look like? What would supply chains look like? What do the end use applications look like? What do those technologies look like? Right? There's this whole opportunity to reinvent the entire ecosystem. And the opportunity is big. And there's some really strong drivers to make that happen. And so really what this panel is about is really rethinking what that future could be. What are some of the basic science and engineering challenges that we're trying to address here? And what are the pathways to getting that out to markets to have the impact that we need to solve these big global challenges that we see today. So that's really what our goal is today in the topic of hydrogen and fuels, where hydrogen is just one of many candidates out there. So we'll certainly hear some, some thoughts on hydrogen specifically, as well as other fuels that are out there. And with that, um, why don't we go ahead and go on to our first presentation. Uh, Joanna, thank you so much for leading us off. So why don't you go ahead and step on up. Looks like, yeah, it looks like your slides are already being presented and take it away. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, I apologize, this is kind of an awkward room, so I hope everyone can see, hear me, and see the slides. I hope we can get this working. Um, so today, like I in, given my introduction, I work at um, a national lab, but it's really closely tied with Stanford. Um, and so we have the benefit of, of having the bright minds of, of Stanford students and postdocs being able to use our lab and, and continuously refreshing sort of our, uh, our mindset. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the, the work that we're doing at the synchrotron. Um, this is a picture of the Stanford synchrotron radiation light source. Um, and um, the types of experiments we can do that you can't do on a normal lab-based x-ray machine. Um, so just a plug for the synchrotron. It is open to anyone who can write a proposal, a three-page proposal. We have um, a proposal uh, applications do three times a year, um, and it is free. Um, so you get allocated time based on the quality of your pro proposal that's peer reviewed. Um, we also are, work very well um, with industry partnerships. Um, so there's a range of, of, of ways that we can work with industry um, from you know, sh you know, sharing, um, really doing fundamental research that they care about, all the way up to um, proprietary work. Um, so we, we span really fundamental science all the way up to proprietary. Um, and then um, this circular building basically um, has different instruments coming out of it, um, and each of those instruments do a very specific thing. And I'm only going to be talking about really three of them. Um, so the first instrument I'm going to talk about is the transmission x-ray microscope. And this is an x-ray microscope. Um, so it's just like a regular microscope, except it uses x-rays instead of visible light or electrons, things like that. Um, the nice thing about an x-ray microscope is you can penetrate through materials, unlike an electron mi uh, microscope. Um, so we use this to look at materials and the systems while they're working. Um, so we can image very quickly, half a second. Um, we get 30 nanometer resolution, so very high resolution. Um, and we can do elemental contrast. And so here's just an example of looking at iridium. Um, and so this is um, iridium catalyst particles um, on a membrane. And we can look at the chemical state of the iridium um, locally. So how is the distribution of the chemistry um, on the membrane um, different 
from spot to spot. Um, this is what we'd say exit shoe, not working, um, but in theory we want to move towards an operating system. So can we see chemistry evolving? And so I'll, I'll um, show you sort of how we're getting towards there in later. Um, so really our aim is to lurk um, with um, sort of, we have this large working distance so we can do a lot of in situ experiments, heating, cooling, operating, um, electrochemical systems, pressure, gas environments, things like that. And so we want to study dynamics. Um, another thing that this microscope can do is tomography. Um, and this is also a good example on what um, it can do instead of an electron microscopy, an electron microscope. So this is um, uh, platinum nickel nanowires um, embedded on top of a uh, membrane. And so you're looking through the membrane and how are the wires interacting with each other? How are they interconnected in 3D? Um, and so there's different types of ways that they've been manufactured. And we wanted to see the interconnection of the wires, so we did 3D imaging where we can see the wires. Um, and then we can do larger fields of views just in 2D to see how the wires are interacting. Um, and then um, uh, we looked at also the redistribution of, for example, the nickel. Yeah, okay. the, um, uh, they do an acid leach trying to um, take the nickel platinum alloy and preserve that. We're leaching out all of the nickel metal. And what we could see, maybe eventually, is that the nickel can redistribute elsewhere in the membrane. And so um, because we have a visual um, image of what's going on, we can see that it's not just coming out, it's also redistributing. Thank you. Um, so that is um, sort of a motivation on why we want to do 3D imaging. You can visualize interconnections um, and why we um, want to be able to see metals oh. in, a, um, in a membrane where we're, we're, we're really transparent to the membrane. Um, so but we can see the metals. So moving on to the project I really want to focus the next um, few slides on is um, work that I've been doing with Tom, um, looking at um, relevant devices. So this is a proton exchange membrane, water electrolyzer, so the green way to make hydrogen. Um, and um, we, um, this is the concept, these are components of this real working device with an anode and a cathode that actually functions like um, an industry, industrially relevant device. Um, and it has a, an x-ray transparent window in it which does not affect its performance. And so we can test this in the lab and then we can bring this to the synchrotron and study it with the x-rays. So the second experiment I want to um, talk about, or the second technique I want to talk about, is how do we ca track chemical changes and track them really precisely. And so this is a technique um, called high resolution X-ray fluorescence detection um, with advanced X-ray spectroscopy. And so the idea is that you can take monochromatic single energy X-rays, shine them on your sample, and that will tell you about your chemistry if you change the energy. But you can also take the photons coming off, the fluorescent X-rays coming off your sample, and um, distinguish their energies as well. So you know the energy coming in, you know the energy coming out. Now you can get incredibly precise information about what um, the energy of each photon is. And that will help you get very precise, high resolution spectrum, spectrum. So this is a spectrum of iridium chemistry in that working device. Um, and we, you can see the subtle changes that are happening. And so we need this high resolution um, detection to be able to, 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 to see these subtle changes that are happening in this working device. Um, and so this is just one example of what we're doing with this. The second example um, is to take that x-ray microscope, but scale it up. Go, um, instead of a microscope, just do imaging. Um, so not as high resolution, but a larger field of view. And so um, sometimes you don't want to have the highest resolution image ever, because you're seeing one tree instead of seeing the forest. So this is going to allow us to see the whole membrane, both um, electrodes and how they're interacting. We can again do this chemical information um, looking at the iridium, but we can also look at the platinum chemistry on both um, uh, electrodes, and we can see how it's distributed um, in 2D while the device is running. Finally, we can also see um, bubble formation. Where are we actually creating hydrogen and oxygen? 
and watch where those bubbles and the speed of the bubbles and, um, and things like that and compare that to the chemical chemistry. Um, so because this allows us to have a larger field of view, there's fewer limitations on the device. And so we can see similar things like in the microscope, um, but on a more larger scale and in industrial relevant um, device. So finally, just the people who are working on this project, like I said, Tom's on it. Um, Demosthenes Sakaris is um, working on the spectroscopy. I'm doing most of the imaging. Um, but really, the people who are actually doing the work are on the bottom. Um, and so uh, we've got a number of postdocs and um, project scientists and associate staff who are, are really um, making this project work. One last slide, and then I'm done. So um, sometimes I said at the beginning that it was really nice to see 3D, but then I told you an example of a relevant device that was 2D. So sometimes you want to see 3D, but you still have to have a relevant device. So we are continuing to develop capabilities. And so one thing that we're developing right now that we have funding to do is how do we do 3D imaging of a flat sample? Tomography doesn't work. The standard tomography of rotating sample doesn't work. Your sample becomes really thick at the high energies. And so we're using laminography and developing that um, to enable micron resolution of 3D, images, uh, 3D objects that are flat, like membranes. And so this is going to be something that in the future, five years from now, I'm going to be asking for devices um, uh, to, to image um, when we get this working. So constantly evolving both the techniques we're doing, but also the science we're applying them to. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Wow. wow, those are really hard experiments. What you saw up there, that was extremely difficult. Joanna made that look easy extremely sophisticated, highly advanced uh, capabilities that you can only find at a national lab, along with a scientist who knows how to use those tools, as well as a community of scholars who know how to build the devices. Uh, there was a lot of very great, basic, fundamental knowledge and understanding in what Joanna just showed. But the key thing is it's really extending, as she was saying at the end, towards real operating systems. If we want to make any technology better, cheaper, more durable, et cetera, we need to understand the inner workings of how it works at the atomic and molecular scale. That's the information that, that those techniques are showing us. And then from that, you can then innovate from there. So cool. Awesome. And I see Mateo's all lined up, Great. so go get him. Thank you so much, Tom. All right. Thank you. Th thank you, Tom, for leading the panel and uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, so in the next uh, few minutes, I want to give you a, a, a chance to, to uh, look at some of the research that we're doing in hydrogen. And uh, that's the main uh, uh, character here today. That's why we're here today, hydrogen. And I want to give you just a very brief introduction, one slide. Apologies for those of you that may be familiar with this, just to get us on the same page. So first of all, hydrogen is an extremely important molecule to begin with already today. Uh, and uh, the global hydrogen demand is in the order of like 150 million tons and, and growing. Um, and uh, of those, um, uh, of that large quantity of hydrogen that is used in industry, most of it is used for uh, ammonia, mostly fertilizers, uh, petroleum refining, uh, methanol, and then other uses like in metallurgy, steel, and other processing as well. Uh, clearly, we are looking at hydrogen as a possible cleaner or clean energy vector for the future. So it's expected, it, we expect the demand to further increase in these sectors as well as expand in terms of the market. Uh, when we look at the global hydrogen production, right now there's a couple different processes that are accounting for, actually three processes that are accounting for most of the hydrogen that is produced. These are steam methane reforming, petroleum reforming, and coal gasification. This means that we have three um, sources of hydrogen, mainly fossil fuels, that are producing up to like 90, 95% of the hydrogen today. Uh, now, what is um, one of the objectives in this area is to produce hydrogen with low uh, CO2 emissions. And all of these processes come from fossil fuels and emit CO2 in uh, converting um, hydrogen from those molecules into uh, molecular hydrogen. Uh, so water electrolysis is currently a process that is used, used to make so-called green hydrogen. Uh, right now, roughly 4 to 5 percent, but growing. And uh, when we look at the um, uh, enthalpy of the reaction, pure enthalpy of the reaction, then we realize that the water electrolysis, which is the process which is considered the one that um, 
is the most promising in uh, producing CO2 free hydrogen in the future as a um, standard enthalpy of the reaction, uh, roughly the energy needed required to go from water to uh, hydrogen, this is roughly four times or five times that of uh, steam methane reforming. And when it comes to energy barriers to create uh, a, a molecule like hydrogen, this uh, now, of course, um, converts into a higher cost. So right now, the cost of making hydrogen from steam reforming is about $1.2 to $1.5 per kilogram. Water electrolysis is around $4 per kilogram, clearly decreasing um, in, the, in the near future, but still rather uh, far away from where we need it to be. Our research, and I'll show you in a second, is about a potential other alternative, which is methane, we call it methane splitting, or methane pyrolysis, where you have a source of methane is, in this case, st uh, sorry, the source of hydrogen is, in this case, still methane, that potentially, potentially is a fossil fuel, but there are other options as well, and I'll show you in a second. Now, when we look at methane pyrolysis, it produces hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, by splitting the methane molecule into solid carbon and hydrogen. And now the enthalpy of the reactions, and in principle, the energy required to make that reaction happen is roughly seven or eight times lower than that required by water electrolysis. So can we make that happen and uh, produce hydrogen without carbon emissions in the form of CO2 in the atmosphere by then taking advantage of that solid carbon as a way to store that carbon rather than emitting into the atmosphere? So the big picture that we envision is having a pyrolysis plant of um, uh, different sizes that you can imagine, uh, from small and distributed to larger scale plants, potentially where the natural gas may be coming from um, a shale gas well, at least for now, but could potentially be coming from other sources uh, of uh, carbon. From ex for example, from the atmosphere, where we uh, convert CO2 into biomass uh, using uh, photosynthesis in plants, convert that into a biogas plant into now methane and CO2, and potentially enriching that in methane, and then feeding that to a pyrolysis plant. So in principle, we can imagine that methane coming directly from air uh, with all the caveats that we can discuss later in the panel. Then utilizing, again, the hydrogen with all the, for all the uses that we need. And then what do we do with that carbon? The carbon is, has to be an important player in this um, uh, scenario because for each um, kilogram of hydrogen that we produce, we also produce uh, roughly three kilograms of uh, carbon as a byproduct. But is it really a byproduct? If that carbon is amorphous, we can imagine, and some uh, startup companies are working on that, uh, throwing it away, landfilling, putting it into um, unused mines. But what if that carbon is in a form that can be technologically useful? For example, carbon nanotubes that we can use to make fibers, films, or fillers, and displays potentially other uh, major contributing uh, factors to CO2 emissions in the environment. For example, carbon nanotubes fibers could be com conductive, thermally and electrically conductive, and replace metals like copper, steel, aluminum. They are also very strong. Films could be used in textiles, and fillers could be used in construction materials. And this is an idea that uh, uh, we're not uh, the only ones working on, uh, but something that has been uh, translated into a vision uh, by a colleague of mine that I'd like to mention uh, with the opportunity to build basically a future, a sustainable future with carbon. And this is the work by uh, another Matteo, uh, also from Italy, Matteo Pasquale uh, from Rice University that together with Cal Car Masters from Shell a few, a uh, couple years ago wrote this interesting perspective in, um, um, in a, a scientific journal where the title was very captivating. Uh, we can use carbon to decarbonize and get hydrogen for free in the sense that we can transform, convert that carbon uh, from methane into carbon nanotubes that could be used for a variety of different um, uh, uh, applications and then get potentially the hydrogen for free because at that point hydrogen could be the byproduct. So this is a schematic that Matteo put together and again I give credit to him 
in developing relationships between Stanford and Rice that are ongoing, where the main important question, though, is how do we go from methane to carbon and hydrogen in first place? So this is something that I started working on with um, my colleague in mechanical engineering, Aruma Jumdar, a few years back. So I'll show you the state of the art right now that we published already and patented before. So in order to convert that methane into carbon and hydrogen, we do need a catalyst because otherwise the conditions would be too high temperature and we would not be able to control the carbon in the way we want. So we start from a fresh catalyst that is usually iron on alumina, relatively cheap and relatively relatively scalable to me. We reduce that iron precursor to ensure that we have metallic iron, that is the active form of the catalyst, then that metallic iron can catalyze the decomposition and splitting of methane into carbon nanotubes and hydrogen. Um, and uh, at that point, we have to introduce a process that would allow us to separate the solid carbon from our solid catalyst because we want to be able to reuse the catalyst multiple times, many, many times, and be able to continuously produce and remove the carbon while at the same time reusing the catalyst for many, different, many uh, cycles. So the way it looks at the lab scale, we use a fluidized bed reactor for those of you that are uh, chemical engineers in the audience. Uh, this is a picture before and after we run the pyrolysis reaction. First, the catalyst is sort of like reddish because of the iron oxide. After those steps, we see the black color related to the formation of carbon. And if we look at the activity, we get relatively high conversion at relatively mild temperatures. I say mild, meaning 750 to 850 degrees C that are relatively low for this type of processes. And the only product that we see from this reaction is either unreacted methane or pure hydrogen. So we get uh, about 85% conversion in these conditions of methane that is close to the thermodynamic equilibrium with more than 99% hydrogen selectivity and only trace amounts of CO. And this is a picture of the catalyst before and after um, where the difference is that those sort of like darker spots on the bottom right uh, picture that you see are the uh, carbon that is formed around the, um, uh, the, 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 the catalyst spheres. So this is a zoomed in image of that material. Those uh, carbon carpets are peeling off the catalyst and they can be easily removed from the reactor. And you see our fluidized bed and the slow-mo showing the top of our reactor where the carbon is lighter in density and can be removed by a simple uh, stream of inert gas. Uh, these are then the carbon uh, sort of shapes and uh, products that we collect from uh, the filter. Uh, so this is the work that um, I started in collaboration with Arun, but then already a couple of years back, we asked ourselves, how can we demonstrate how we can use that carbon? So that's where the second Matteo came into play. We sent some of our carbon, produced carbon materials to rice. They were not able to make carbon nanotube fibers that require higher ca quality carbon, and we'll get back to that eventually. But we, he was able to make, or his lab was able to make films that demonstrated transparency and conductivity at the same time, potentially allowing us to create transparent conductive films for electronic applications. Uh, lesson learned uh, from this is that the carbon quality is very critical for large scale use. We need to uh, consider that. Catalyst use must be efficient. In our techno-economic analysis, we realized that we do need to recycle that catalyst in order to make this work uh, from an economic perspective. And we need to achieve a process where both the efficiency and the quality of the materials is achieved at the same time. How do we do that? Continuing to develop catalysts and reactors. And more recently, Matteo Pasquale, Arun, um, uh, myself, and uh, a colleague, uh, Alfred Sporman, received a new a couple actually different grants from the Nova Nordisk Foundation and from the Kavli Foundation to continue this work and collaboration. Uh, so uh, this is the pyrolysis team throughout the years. Uh, actually, Henry Moise is here in the audience. Henry, um, raise your hand. So if you are interested in the, all the details, Henry knows much more than, than I do, together with Marco Gigantino and Koshal Parmar that worked on this project more recently in collaboration with uh, Rune's group and uh, Raghubir Gupta from Sastion as well. So happy to dive into details more of this during the panel, and thank you for the opportunity to share the work. Thank you, Matteo. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Tom, for uh, organizing us, bringing us together. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to share some of my work with you today, uh, and actually thanks to the rest of the panel members. Um, this segues, uh, what Matteo talked about segues quite nicely, uh, I think, to, to what I'm gonna talk about, which is basically, um, given a uh, renewable or low or lower uh, carbon source of hydrogen, um, <clears throat> how do we combine that with uh, CO2 to make uh, other fuels that we can use uh, across various energy sectors? Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, liquid uh, hydrocarbon and alcohol fuels, but primarily liquid hydrocarbon fuels for uh, hard to abate sectors like aviation and heavy shipping. So if you take uh, jet fuel and diesel, combined roughly 60 million barrels per day, about, uh, accounts for about 9 billion tons of GHG emissions uh, per year. Um, so how do we think about replacing those with a uh, sustainable alternative? Um, we are focused uh, in particular on uh, one sort of technological uh, vision, if you will, for what's called a power to liquids, which is um, can we take low carbon electricity, CO2 and water as the inputs and generate uh, fuels that service those sectors that I, uh, that I alluded to? Um, schematically, at a, at a very uh, simplified level, it looks like this. Um, we would use uh, water electrolysis to generate the hydrogen, um, obtain the CO2 from some sort of emission stream um, or perhaps from the air directly. Um, we're interested in particular in what are called um, syngas conversion technologies. Um, so starting from hydrogen and CO2, you then need to do a transformation that I've abbreviated as RWGS. Um, and chemical jargon, that's the reverse water gas shift reaction, um, which is shown here, CO2 plus hydrogen to make carbon monoxide plus water. Um, and that's necessary because the syngas conversion technologies need CO. Syngas is CO plus hydrogen. Um, and there are uh, available technologies already proven on scale that can take CO and hydrogen um, and make a variety of liquid fuels, including uh, jet fuel. So I just want to talk for a minute about the upstream and the downstream, um, and then I'll really, uh, because those are commercial technologies at different stages of commercial deployment. Um, in our view, uh, while there are uh, available technologies for reverse water gas shift, um, we think that this is uh, the area in need of the most development in this overall uh, technology package. So this is the opportunity we identified, uh, in particular an opportunity to develop uh, what we think is a new and an enabling catalyst that, that um, unlocks new ways of performing reverse water gas shift that can improve the overall power to liquids uh, efficiency. Um, but just a, a second about the upstream on the, on the uh, renewable hydrogen side. Um, so just thinking about water electrolysis, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, I would say, uh, for scaling water electrolysis um, as reflected in um, announced projects. Um, so this is uh, the most recent projection from McKinsey looking out to 2030. You'll notice the, the, the small base, I think there's about a gigawatt, a little over a gigawatt of deployed water electrolysis capacity today. The projections based on announced um, projects out to 2030 are a really dramatic uh, increase to a couple hundred gigawatts. Um, only a small percentage of those have reached final investment decision. But suffice it to say that there is uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm and, and some uh, significant increase in uh, capital being deployed for water electrolysis, um, not to mention other uh, potential uh, low carbon sources of hydrogen like we just heard about from Mateo. That's upstream. Looking downstream, once you have syngas, the conversion of syngas into liquid hydrocarbons um, has been practiced for almost a century uh, through a process called the Fischer-Tropsch process. This is proven on scale in the sense that there are existing facilities that take syngas, which today is sourced from steam reforming natural gas or coal, um, but take that syngas and convert that into liquid fuels. This is one, uh, one of the larger plants that does 140,000 barrels per day. So we know how to engineer these syngas to liquid conversion systems. Um, a more recently commercialized technology takes syngas um, through a, a relatively low temperature, um, biologically catalyzed process using these microorganisms called acetogens. 
they take that syn gas and they very selectively produce uh, ethanol. So there's a company called Lonzatech that has commercialized this process for producing ethanol fuel from syn gas that they're actually sourcing as a uh, off gas from certain industrial processes that have CO rich um, waste streams. So, so what is the, the challenge then with reverse water gas shift that could basically merge this upstream hydrogen production with this downstream syn gas conversion to enable sort of a seamless power to liquids? Um, I'm gonna get uh, chemical, it's sort of technical here for, for one, uh, one slide, so, so bear with me if, if this is um, not, your, uh, not your forte, it, it doesn't matter. Um, reverse water gas shift in, in chemical jargon is an endothermic reaction, meaning I have to put heat in to drive that. It's moderately endothermic, okay, about 40 kilojoules per mole. The problem is when I bring CO2 and hydrogen to a catalyst, um, there's a competing pathway to make methane that's very exothermic, okay? Um, and so the, the challenge of reverse water gas shift, um, or at least in our view, the most significant challenge is being able to operate at, you know, under industrially relevant conditions while suppressing the methanation reaction, because methane's a dead-end product if you're trying to make a liquid fuel, um, but maintaining the reverse water gas shift reactivity. Um, and if you have an unselective catalyst that just can't do that, it'll do, it'll do either then basically your product distribution is dictated simply by the thermodynamics. And so the endothermic reaction um, is disfavored at low temperatures and the, the heat releasing reaction is favored at low temperatures. So your product distribution is gonna be dominated by methane until you get really hot, okay? At, ab at above 900 or so, the methane is more or less suppressed and you can make CO selectively. And this is what, so so the available technologies today, if you're gonna buy a reverse water gas shift unit, this is what you're buying, okay? They use uh, essentially repurposed steam reforming catalysts. These are nickel-based catalysts. Operate 900 and above, somewhere 900 to 1100. They do that for thermodynamic reasons. The nickel can't se uh, select between CO and methane, so you just operate it at a regime where the methane is in favor. Um, this is being deployed, okay? So there are technology packages for combining high temperature reverse water gas shift with a downstream, say, Fischer-Tropes process um, available from Johnson Matthey and BP, another system available from Halder Topso and Sasol. Maybe you saw on the news a few weeks ago, Infinium just started production of their sustainable aviation fuel plant in Texas. They're using reverse water gas shift um, upstream of Fischer-Tropes. Um, but again, these are high temperature reverse water gas shift, shift technologies. Our thesis is that if you can operate selectively, right? so if I suppress the methane formation, that's what my product curve looks like, where my CO yield curve looks like as a function of temperature. Then I open up the possibility of operating in a lower temperature regime and still having a significant amount of CO coming out of my reactor, which I need for my downstream syngas conversion. Potential advantages of these um, at a simplified level is um, much less expensive metallurgy and um, sort of wall thickness in your reactor design, okay, by operating at, at lower temperatures. Uh, the potential for better heat integration with the downstream and potentially upstream, depending on how you're making your hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> most of the syngas processes, or at least all the ones that I'm aware of, are operating at 300 or, or significantly lower. Um, and these things can lead to, uh, in principle, better proce uh, sorry, process simplification, which can reduce capex and improve energy efficiency. This has been our, our thesis. We've basically uh, developed a catalyst around this that can meet these needs and unlock this um, operating window. Um, and then have been sort of testing that thesis by engagement with external parties over the past year or so. Just to, to tell you what the catalyst is, um, we, it's, a, it's an extremely simple uh, material. We take a carbonate salt, an alkali carbonate, okay, sodium or potassium carbonate. We put that in a mesoporous carrier. We can use a variety of carriers, but alumina is, is really sort of the workhorse of, of large scale heterogeneous catalysis in terms of the carrier. And what we discovered is that when you disperse carbonate into that carrier, you generate a reactive uh, dispersed carbonate species, basically acts as a super base um, that can catalyze reverse water gas shift. So it's an ultra low cost catalyst. Um, this has high activity in this intermediate temperature regime. It's exquisitely selective for CO. We have no transition metals. 
Um, so there's nothing that really has any affinity for CO that could reduce it further to methane. Um, and it's also quite tolerant to impurities. Um, I would show you data from my lab, but I think it's, it's actually more compelling to show you independent evaluation of the catalyst using uh, this uh, uh, company called HTE. They're in, they're in Heidelberg, sort of a premier catalyst testing service provider. Um, they have the ability to test many different catalysts in parallel over a very wide range of operating conditions. I'll just show you a snapshot from a campaign that we ran at HTE last year. Um, looking at these catalysts under um, uh, industrially relevant conditions, so elevated pressure, 10 bar, um, a pretty significant throughput, 30,000 gas hourly space velocity, looking um, right in the sort of heart of this intermediate temperature regime. Um, and what you see here, the red line is the, is the thermodynamic limit for reverse water gas shift. We basically do temperature steps and hold for a, at least a day. The green and the blue are the, um, <clears throat> the potassium carbonate and sodium carbonate on alumina. And then we back off to um, a sub-equilibrium conversion so we can assess stability. So we basically have stability or showed stability over about 400 hours of operating with different input ratios of hydrogen to CO2. Again, at these actually fairly aggressive um, space velocities. And we've, we've looked at a lot of different formulations, done a lot of different stress testing. Um, I would say that, that these catalysts uh, across the board, these carbonate catalysts are exquisitely selective. You're looking at basically the CO selectivity um, for these, the green and the blue are the two catalyst materials um, as a function of time. And these are, um, we, we basically don't see any other products. Um, so where is this going uh, from here? So basically, we started out um, evaluating the catalyst in the form of powders, um, both in my lab and working with uh, some of the, the largest catalyst manufacturers in the world. We've taken it to the multi-kilo scale, um, single step, basically first attempt on scale up from gram to kilogram, reproduce the performance we see on the gram level. We've also verified that the procedures we use to make these catalysts are amenable with procedures used on the multi-kiloton scale per year to make uh, other catalyst materials. Um, and this is just the last slide, just to show you that now we're basically, real catalysts are sort of shaped particles that you would pack into larger reactors. Um, and we've sort of shifted our development and science to um, optimizing formulations with these, uh, with these different shaped catalysts um, and testing them in our lab and, uh, and long uh, duration runs as well as putting them in the hands of end users to do um, pilot demonstrations integrated with um, different uh, syngas conversion technologies. So uh, thanks again for the chance to, to talk today, and thanks for your attention. So. Standing, thank you. So I'm going to tell you about uh, underground hydrogen storage. And uh, this is a relatively you know, new project for us. And, uh, we have a, a pretty good uh, team uh, that really spans a lot of disciplines from uh, fluid mechanics to reactor transport to mechanics. And uh, the, the, I guess the opportunity space here is, is kind of illustrated through a couple of slides here. So this is a picture of curtailed electricity in California. So Curtailed electricity means electricity you could have generated, but nobody wanted it. Um, so it's basically you know clean electricity that's being thrown away. Uh, so this is like a really great time of the year for curtailed electricity in California because it's not very hot, uh, it's really sunny, um, and so there's uh, you know basically electricity going to waste. Green is wind, uh, yellow is solar, and you can see this is going up every year. Uh, Last year was a record curtailment in March, 700 uh, megawatt hours just in that month. Um, and overall, last year, there were 2.7 terawatt hours uh, in California of renewable electricity that you know, were not used. So with electrolysis, that might have been you know, something like 54 million kilograms of hydrogen. And then you could say, well, where would I put this? Um, you know, like these high performance uh, tanks uh, with a carbon fiber material, uh, super interesting. They hold like four kilograms of hydrogen each. Uh, so you would need a lot of those tanks. <laughs> so we're looking uh, underground, right? Because, uh, you know, in the subsurface, we have uh, geological structures, 
sort of like illustrated here. This is a sandstone, so the gray are the grains, the black are the pore space. Uh, in some cases, like in a depleted gas reservoir, you know, that pore space is pressure depleted and, and there's only a gas there. So just to give you an example of the potential, we can look at the Rio Vista gas field. This is near Sacramento. Uh, it's produced something like 3.8 trillion cubic feet of uh, gas to date. And uh, if we replace that volume with hydrogen, um, it's something like you know, close to 9 billion kilograms of hydrogen in that single um, structure. So big opportunity space. And that's kind of what our project is about is really sort of uh, a fundamental science look at flow, transport, and reactivity uh, of hydrogen in these uh, systems, trying to really, as we go, draw out uh, practical results. Uh, and then, you know, in the end, we'll have, uh, hopefully, you know, a, a reliable, large-scale um, uh, way of doing this. So uh, this is a cartoon from uh, a, a really well-cited review article that was written. And the, the point I kind of want to make here is that we, people have really been drawing cartoons. Uh, and uh, somewhat disturbingly, the cartoons are all pretty similar, uh, which means there's a lot of groupthink that's happened. Uh, and so we're trying to kind of you know, pull these things back a little bit and, and understand. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to really only maybe tell you two stories. One is about flow regimes. So if you imagine this gas-water interface, there's interesting things that could happen there. Uh, and the other thing uh, I want to tell you about is hydrogen degradation uh, due to reaction in the, in the porous medium. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll skip through. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I'm going to just say and, and skip over the sort of the proof for this is people have been drawing this kind of a picture where hydrogen sort of magically rises to, it, it is a buoyant gas. Um, it sort of rises to the top of other gases uh, in the storage zone and uh, we don't find any evidence for that, right? It's, it's a very diffusive system, it tends to mix and that's what this story is about. But I'm going to skip in order to... Uh, Get to, get to here. So what the, the, the interesting thing for me, or one of the interesting things for me, is really that the hydrogen flow in porous media is in like a parameter space that we haven't examined very much. So this is one way that we sort of think about flow in porous media. These are dimensionless numbers. So on this scale uh, is the ratio of uh, viscous forces to capillary forces. You can think about that's like the flow rate over the tension of the fluids. Uh, on this one is the bond number. So that's really like the buoyancy over the tension of the fluids. Uh, and then going back is the so-called mobility ratio. So that's the, you can think of that as the ratio of viscosities, right? So Hydrogen has a low viscosity. Water has a relatively large viscosity. That means it's, it's very mobile. So the, the things that are colored here are sort of you know, regimes in this parameter space that we've looked at quite a bit because you know, there are commercially viable things that are of interest. So sort of this pink color is uh, CO2 um, sequestration, CO2 uh, EUR. And um, sort of out at the very end of this parameter space is really where the hydrogen storage uh, conditions lie, right? So it, in general, means that uh, hydrogen is very buoyant. Uh, it's also very mobile because the viscosity is low, and we haven't looked at it a whole lot. So the, the um, you know, Im implications are sort of like indicated here. So these are uh, high resolution visualizations of uh, water in blue, gas in red, flow in fractures or, or pores. You can think of them that way. And you, know, you can see in this, this case that says slug that there's very different sort of flow profiles, which you see indicated in that uh, middle panel, right? That the velocity profiles are different. And so why that's important is that the chemicals that are, or the components, the things that are convecting in the water um, 
are going to have different sort of concentration um, profiles. Uh, and so, having said that, I'm going to move forward here. And again, some experimental evidence showing how buoyant the system is. Uh, I want to say a little bit about you know reactivity of um, hydrogen. So. Uh, not to worry everybody, but a bunch of chemical reactions on the right-hand side here. And what we're really interested in is the interaction of hydrogen with iron-bearing um, minerals, okay? And uh, the kind of products that we are worried about is H2S, okay? Because that is, causes a, a safety problem. Uh, there's, it's still quite a usable molecule in terms of its uh, energy content. And I don't want to worry anybody, but uh, I'm going to say this, right? We set up test cases to make H2S, okay? So you'll, you're going to see H2S created. We did this on um, purpose, okay? So, um, so for instance, this is sort of what the uh, porous medium looks like. It has a lot of pyrite. That's one of the iron-bearing uh, minerals. And then some things on the right that describe it. So it looks like a sandstone. It looks like a depleted gas reservoir. Um, and so, in fact, we put all of these reactions into a, uh, a kind of a subsurface simulator uh, that can simulate uh, things. So this is thick. You can think of it as tens of meters thick. It originally had natural gas in it. It's depleted of water, right? Um, although water is one of the things that we'll look at. Uh, and then the red is the hydrogen. Uh, and so we basically just put this pulse of hydrogen in, and then we let it sit, uh, and we watch it. We watch it react, right? So in the future, we'll actually simulate, you know, injection and 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 uh, removal. So uh, again, don't. I don't want people to worry too much, but uh, this is hydrogen loss, okay, versus uh, iron content, okay? So uh, on the far right would be very little iron, and as we move this way, we get more um, reactive iron. Two minerals, so hematite, okay, and gertite in yellow, and what's shaded are sort of the sensitivity bounds, right? So we varied the reactive surface area by a few orders of magnitude. We varied the amount of water uh, that's there. Uh, we varied the reaction parameters, okay? And so we can sort of map out the space of what, you know, where we think uh, you know, the reaction might lie, right? So this is teaching us that we really want to look for systems without too much iron uh, in the minerals to store it, okay? Um, and so uh, here, again, those two minerals, hematite and gertite, those are the main um, you know, minerals that we're really interested in that are iron-bearing, okay? And as, so this is varying the ratio of iron in the two plus oxidation state and iron in the three plus oxidation state. And here it's really the iron in the three plus oxidation state that's very reactive. So as we move this direction to the origin, we are uh, basically putting more iron in the, the uh, two plus oxidation state and the reactivity is um, going down. And in, you know, this is saying, right, that as we let the system sit there and just react, um, that it's actually predicting, you know, again, quite a bit of H2S is going to be formed, right? So in the order of hundreds to thousands of parts per million. But ag again, this is the, um, you know, we, we set this up to, to be reactive this way. Uh, and practically, right, this is also saying, you know, we should look for systems that don't have a lot of iron. If you do have a system that has a lot of iron, uh, go in and do some acid leaching and, and sort of clean it up. So where this is sort of going, uh, these are all done within sort of a traditional subsurface uh, simulator. It's solving uh, a whole lot of uh, differential equations, solving the reaction part. Uh, and we're also working on sort of very much speeding this up. So how do we do this a lot faster? So this is a, a numerical represent, well, a, a code representation of one reaction. Uh, and so sort of working on this, this 
these reactions can be solved in a way that's much faster. Uh, and, you know, again, this, the space can be uh, evaluated a lot more quickly, and we can look at the interaction of flow and uh, transport. So, uh, yeah, again, right, this is, you know, sort of leading us to think about, you know, H2S formation and saying really, well, uh, look for clean sandstones, uh, and if you don't have a clean sandstone, uh, think about doing some uh, tests to see how reactive, you know, the iron that you have is there, and perhaps even think about um, doing some acid leaching to, to remove the iron. And so that's it. That's where we are at the moment. Uh, again, really trying to move from that cartoon representation that I showed to um, a, a really good physical understanding. And so that's where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Tony. Mm -hmm. Super. <laughs> so I invite all our panelists to uh, take a seat. And uh, what I'd like to do is maybe first just kind of frame what we just heard, uh, which I thought was really exciting. Number one, hydrogen. Okay. It's already just, I don't know if that was mentioned today, but the current annual production rate is 70, 80 megatons a year of hydrogen. That's about 10 kilograms per person on Earth production rate. Okay, on average, of course, everyone in this room consumes way more than our fair share. So it's already here today. The question is, can we make it through other ways that are more sustainable? Joanna talked about uh, water electrolysis. Matt mentioned there's a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of different reasons on water electrolysis for green hydrogen. Okay, already over 100 gigawatts of announced projects. Many of those are already getting financed, many more uh, to go, potentially. But that's not the only way to do it. Thankfully, Joanna is because uh, it's expensive. And Joanna is working on ways to understand how those technologies work, why they, why they do what they do, what, what they could do better. And then that helps inform innovation and design to make them cheaper and higher performance, which would lower the cost. But we don't want to put our eggs into any one basket. Mateo then talked about a different way of making hydrogen through methane pyrolysis, leveraging natural gas resources already that we have today. Fossil fuels themselves are not bad intrinsically. However, it's how we use them that sends the CO2 into the atmosphere. So there's a way we can use that resource to convert them into make building blocks, uh, building materials, materials for everyday life, and hydrogen. That could be a win-win proposition. Of course, there's technology development along those lines. Let's say we have lots of hydrogen entering the market. There's questions, is this, can this be used as a standalone fuel for heating, for transportation, et cetera? Potentially, there's technologies out there that are worth designing and thinking about. But there's also using that hydrogen as a feedstock. That's what Matt talked about to make for aviation fuels and all the conventional fuels that we typically use in cars and trucks and ships and airplanes, using that sustainably sourced hydrogen and reacting it with CO2 to make the products that we need. And then, of course, hydrogen being all across that ecosystem is not just about generating it and using it. You need to figure out a way to store it. And that's what Tony was talking about, just really what can we think about in terms of uh, geological formations for storage and how to think uh, how to do that safely, effectively, and cheaply. So we've, got, we've covered a lot of bases here on this panel. There's other bases we could touch on. They have much broader expertise than the things that they had uh, to share with you today in their uh, few minutes of fame. Maybe I'll ask one question to the panel, the seed discussion, and I really encourage everybody to think about questions, anything you want to ask. It could be a, a atomistic level stuff. It could be big picture stuff, policy stuff, you know, uh, geo, geological, uh, global stuff. Think about whatever questions you like. All right, the one question I want to start off with is uh, what all of you touched on today was you brought your strong fundamental science to the table and are making advances in that space and with a keen eye towards commercialization and translation. So what lessons have you learned in that process, which is not an easy process, and what could you teach us in the room in terms of those lessons learned to help others aspire to, who aspire to do the same? Who would like to go first to answer that one? Matt, go for it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to go first. Uh, yeah, I, I can speak in particular to uh, trying to design research projects with an eye to scale, because the problems we're working on, uh, the solutions have to be implemented at scale. I would say what I've learned in the past several years is that it's incredibly valuable to uh, gain as much insight as possible into how things are produced and processed today, both in terms of the types of transformation, separations, what have you, and in the infrastructure that's available. Because ideally, <clears throat> you can, with a new catalyst or new material, or perhaps new process, 
if you want to scale quickly to impact the problem um, on a relevant time scale, you can leverage as much as possible existing assets. Um, but we don't typically learn a lot about the existing assets out there in the world of, of making chemicals and fuels and, and, and those various processes. You don't learn a whole lot about those on, on the farm, uh, as it's called. Uh, you have to go out and, and see those places firsthand and interface with the people working in industry. That can help sort of frame the, the challenges in terms of what is the realistic space of parameters that I can adjust, materials I can use, manipulations I can do that if successful, <clears throat> then I could take advantage of a lot that's already out there to, to bring something along. I think there's a lot of value to that and it's not um, emphasized maybe as, as much as it, as it could be. So. Yeah, great points. Anyone else want to chime I, in? I'll yeah, Joanna. That. Um, I was, I was going to say actually collaborations was one mm -hmm. thing that I, I've seen is very important in these types of scale ups because um, you really know your stuff, but you know, you don't, you're not able to really broaden out and think of the big picture sometimes. Um, and I think one example of that is, is asking the right questions. So if you're thinking about, you know, how does this degrade over time with use, you know, you may know on a fundamental level that these are the three things that are degra degrading, but maybe only one of them matters over the long time. So, so knowing which questions to ask and who to ask them to, I think is really important. Thank you. Yeah. Tony or Mateo? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that uh, I think what's super important is actually like going out and measuring things. Do it. This is what this panel's great, was really good about, right? People actually talked about experiments and measuring things, right? But often, you know, we think, oh, it's going to work like this way. And, you know, a few well designed tests um, can either validate or invalidate that and I think add a huge amount of value. Mateo. Sure, yeah, adding sort of like along the lines of what Matt was, was uh, talking about. One thing I learned, I think, especially in um, several scientific discussions that with my colleague Aruma Jumdar, I, I, I tended to think uh, of an idea with a goal in mind. Then you start from the beginning and the pathway to get to that sort of like goal starts to, instead of being linear, starts to like turn here and there and then there's like bifurcations. And uh, one thing, one possibility is to think about that finish line and walk backwards. Then that, that trajectory may not be completely linear, but it is easier potentially to be able to identify sort of like challenges that um, would be used to modify your, uh, your strategy to then connect as linearly as possible that target line with then where you start. And for example, one thing that has been uh, discussed already, like for example, the scale, right? If you start from your idea, and by the time you get your convoluted strategy to get to, to the goal, but you forget about the scalability of one of the steps in between, whereas if the final goal, like hydrogen, is already scalability to begin with, then you would start walking backwards and you will realize, okay, it has to be scalable to begin with. So you would already eliminate some of those side, side uh, pathways that would take you away from your straight line if you were to start from, from the beginning till the end. So that sort of like walking backwards has been quite uh, helpful. All excellent points. I'll, I'll make one comment, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and that is that I think you know it's it's wonderful that we have organizations that uh, that organize this conference, the Precourt Institute for Energy. Uh, number one, all of us have benefited from the existence of of that particular organization that really brings the community together. Certainly at Stanford, but also at Slack. Clearly, we're benefiting from that as well, from a broader ecosystem of scholars. You as well, you as well, all of you in the room, bringing us together to have these important conversations. Try to figure out what are the real challenges and what are the real opportunities. And now we have an accelerator as well, and that's something that is unique that you just don't find out there in the world, the university that established an accelerator, which is really a way of saying uh, within the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, we have all this, this talent on this campus and in this ecosystem and at Slack 
And what really brought us a lot of us together here in the first place was uh, basic research and education, because that's what universities do and do extremely well. And if you take some of that intellectual capacity and capability and really inspire that community to start thinking more towards how can I have more direct impact and how do you enable that through bringing in people with expertise, some of whom are in the room today, as well as with resources to get started, to get launched, that's, we're seeing a tangible benefit that the community is starting to respond to that. And people who wouldn't otherwise be thinking, how can I advance some tech and the, my basic science, the thing that I'm doing, how can I start uh, thinking about ways to commercialize this, get this off campus, what are the hard questions that I need to ask now so that I know that I'm on the right track, that if I answer those questions, I will be in the right direction when it's time to go off campus and, and build something big. So uh, we're very uh, fortunate to be part of this ecosystem, and I thank many of you in the room who are contributing on that effort. All right, I will pause there and uh, open it up for Q&A. I think Arpita has the mic, so just raise your hand, and Arpita will hustle on over. <laughs> thank you, Arpita. <laughs> Please introduce yourself hello, as hello. well. That would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, I'm Tom Perry. I'm with a company called Phoenix Energy, and we use biomass gasification in projects that are community scale to produce electricity. And so um, Matt, you know, Matt talked about uh, syngas. Um, I've got questions about you know, what, is, what does syngas mean to you? What is the makeup of syngas? Because we already produce syngas. Um, and you know, I'm wondering, you know, is there is there a path to syngas and then you know the modification of that that does not necessarily involve electrolysis right is there you know is there a sort of faster way uh, to you know to get there a faster cheaper way um, yeah so sure. that that, yeah. that would be a start for me <clears throat> yeah happy to answer that yeah i i for the interest of time i didn't have a chance to mention this yeah so so waste uh, or i should say more, you know biomass residues or municipal waste um, gasifying those is another way to generate syngas. Um, it, you know, the composition of syngas that's useful depends entirely on what your downstream technology is. Okay, um, so I can't give a specific, you, you know, um, breakdown of what has to be in the in the syngas. It depends on what you're sort of um, marrying it with uh, down downstream. But as a resource, um, so if you look sort of at, at aviation, what are we doing now? We're doing HEFA, right? Hydro treating esters and fatty acids. The next most accessible thing is basically taking um, these already, you know, basically these energy containing residues that are already available and just getting them into a form where I can process them chemically to make fuels. Okay, so that's, I would sort of put what you described in that category. Um, <clears throat> I think power to liquid, if you think about reaching a scale that can meet EU mandates uh, or targets in the US or anything that anybody's talking about to truly decarbonize even aviation, you know, let alone diesel, you run out of those resources. So I think those things can and, and absolutely should be done in an opportunistic way, um, but you simply don't have enough feedstock um, in order to reach, you know, 50% penetration of the of the aviation fuel market, you know, for example. So, so we're sort of thinking about the what we think is the ultimate scalable solution, which has to be taken back, in my opinion, to water, CO2, and and power. Yeah. And 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 given that scalability requirement, does that contemplate doing any of these projects in California, where it's incredibly hard to, you know, get you know, get, get these things permitted, and then there's, like, I don't know how, you know, much consumption of water there is, you know, in, in your process, but, you know, generally, we have water shortages. Yeah, no, so, I, I mean, I, th those decisions need to be made on a project-by-project -project basis, right? Um, and so I think for pure power-to-liquid plays, uh, maybe not in California to start. Um, in, in the U.S., it depends so much on, on you know, various incentives. There's a federal incentive level, but then there's also state incentives, which drive a lot of it. Um, but yeah, it's at a very, power to liquids are at a very early stage of deployment in the sense that the technology pack, some technology packages are available, how they play out, what the real cost is if you deploy them, sort of to be determined. Um, and I don't know to what extent people have gotten to the, you know, where are the best places to locate them. Um, I think, you know, 
it looks like in the south is, is sort of where it's landing at the moment. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had a question from Mateo. Please introduce yourself. Oh, yes. Mind. Thank you. I, I'm Darren. I'm with Roadrunner. We're a venture studio. Um, I'm just curious, why, given the structural deficit of graphite coming up in the next decade, why focus on carbon nanotubes as opposed to creating graphite? And then maybe a broader question for the group is, is dry methane reformation a red herring? Well, so uh, first of all, we started with carbon nanotubes. We're not even making carbon nanotubes yet. It's mostly like fiber, so we need to improve the quality. But there's no reason to then limit ourselves to one specific form of carbon. Now, the, for, um, re, for reasons related to then reusing the callus, making the carbon nanotubes could more easily uh, lead us to then be able to reuse the catalyst in multiple cycles. And it's just about the, the science of breaking that carbon uh, catalyst bond. And once you start forming graphite layers, graphene and then graphite layers, those usually tend to encapsulate completely the catalyst. So the physical separation just becomes harder. It's possible. So we are looking at how to make graphite, but the other, um, the other challenge that we have to solve is that once you make graphite, there's um, graphite is, in all cases, even carbon nanotubes, these are very heterogeneous. It's a single word that encompasses a very heterogeneous class of materials. So even making graphite would not guarantee that you have the right type of graphite, for example, in batteries, because those are specifically treated to remove defects and allow lithium to get stored in and out. Um, so we have to solve all these issues, the challenges of making the right type of carbon. And we just started, so with uh, Henry, uh, just right behind you, Henry has been uh, working uh, more towards the idea of making graphite at slightly higher temperatures than what we're operating than carbon nanotubes. That's a possibility. Thanks. And I don't know if anyone wants to take the dry methane yeah, question. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. So the dry methane. Yeah. Uh, so you were talking about, sorry, can you repeat the dry methane reforming as an? Yeah, is, that, is that feasible or is it just, I mean, it's feasible, but does it make sense or is it a red? So I'll give you my personal opinion. Um, so for, for the audience, maybe it's good to explain. Dry methane reforming would be, in principle, a one-to-one -one reaction between methane, CH4, and CO2 that would then lead to CO and hydrogen, so basically syngas and, and CO2. There's CO, CO2, and hydrogen. And people, uh, if I read in the last maybe five years uh, papers on dry reforming, people say this is the holy grail. You take two greenhouse gases, react them into useful products, right? There's a lot of issues with that. First of all, it's thermodynamically very difficult reaction to run. You need very high temperatures for conversion, which is, of course, the same problem also with uh, pyrolysis. So not that uh, it's not affected at that, but you need high temperatures. You have problems of reactivity. Uh, and then you end up with, uh, again, this Singas ratio that uh, could potentially be useful, but uh, it, other technologies seem to be much more mature and promising than the dry reforming. So it, could, it, it is an option, but for different reasons, haven't been looked at um, uh, commercially as much. Maybe I, <clears throat> I could just add to that. I, I view it as a it basically hedging on the risk that electricity you know, renewable electricity prices won't come down as one hopes and needs them to in order to make a, a more conventional power to liquids or power to fuel system viable. So methane is going to be cheaper, right? <clears throat> so you're bringing in some of your, instead of, instead of power, you're bringing in some of your energy content in the form of methane. Um, and so, you know, it's different from just steam reforming methane, right? Because I'm using CO2 as a carbon source. So it's basically, I sort of view it as in between conventional gas to liquids or gas to chemical or whatever you're gonna do starting from steam reforming and a you know, fully sustainable feedstock power to liquids. It's kind of in, in between. And my understanding is that there are some systems being uh, scaled now, built out uh, commercially. Um, but yeah, you have to be willing to tolerate methane, I guess, from an investor or, or um, project point of view, from a carbon management point of view. 
Yeah, if I can maybe just add a quick note on that. I think there's a lot of options, and I don't. It's not clear that uh, for the case of um, driver forming, if there's a showstopper there per se. I mean, it's just a, an approach, right? And there's many approaches. Every approach we've talked about today is subject to risks and challenges, and. You know, it's, uh, I think, you know, keeping an open lens or an open eye towards possibilities and trying to say what are the issues and how do we address them, just keeping as many options in, at play as possible. Jim, you had your hand yes, up. Yes, Good to see you. Tim DeSanto, Modus Ventures. We're a early stage venture capital firm, Menlo Park, <clears throat> focusing on climate and AI. Question for Professor Kanan. Uh, I think your last slide on the RWGS Catalyst said, mentioned something about scale up. Is that scale up for manufacture of the catalyst powder, or is it for the actual production system that would make the syngas with that powder, or both? It's and <clears throat> how's that being done? Is that uh, a third party under license from the university? Just curious. Sure. Yeah, so it's done. It's done with uh, in industry partners. There's some work on scale up of the catalyst manufacturing, but the more important piece right now is. Um, pilot demonstrations you know with with parties that have you know, a, a complete technology package so that's the that's the next most important goal that's the the key sort of scale up activity is instead of evaluating this standalone in reactors where i i measure my syngas integrate it into right. you know somebody's process so that's the focus right now yeah. Yes, Raphael Legal from Total Energy. I have two questions for, for Matt. The first one uh, concerns your new catalyst for reverse water gas shift. So we, we saw that it's very stable at 450 degrees C. Have you got the possibility to, uh, to test this catalyst, the stability of this catalyst, with pollutants? Because in bio CO2 or anthropogenic CO2, we could have and we have some pollutants in, uh, in the gas. And the second question is, um, uh, as you uh, uh, use a, a low temperature for your, your catalyst, uh, normally you, you consume less uh, uh, energy. So I would like to know if you have evaluated the gain in terms of energy efficiency for the overall value chain from CO2 to uh, paraffins. Sure. <coughs> yeah, so with respect to the first question, we have evaluated um, 50 ppm H2S, and we don't see any effect that's also been validated by a third party, so that the catalyst doesn't have any poisoning by H2S. Um, it's obviously not the only impurity one, one worries about. Um, we, we, don't, we think that it should have broad impurity tolerance, again, because you don't have a, a, a metal ion that can bind tightly. You basically can't make covalent bonds. Right to a to a transition metal, you can't passivate a transition metal surface or something like that. So, um, but you know, to be determined for for various impurities. Um, yeah, and then the we have done some of our own just Aspen level modeling um, around. Okay, if I substitute a high temperature for an intermediate temperature reverse water gas shift without doing much on. I think in reality, you're going to have to significantly redesign the downstream to optimally utilize that change. Um, but we have seen sort of modest improvements in energy efficiency with just that sort of standalone substitution. Our sense is that there's an opportunity for significantly greater savings if you are willing to sort of modify the downstream more significantly. But, yeah. uh, Stefan Ramos, Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, my question is for Tony. So we're evaluating our uh, natural gas reservoirs for hydrogen compatibility, and we're running through kind of a checklist of risks or concerns to evaluate prior to running a pilot. Uh, one of the concerns our reservoir engineering team has is on weld integrity, uh, the casing, the cement, the pipe itself, and uh, the, weakest, the weakest point being kind of the threaded connections. So I was wondering if you've done any research on the hydrogen impact to the weld integrity. Yeah, we, we haven't done that. Yeah, yeah, that we have talked about spinning up a project to do that. But yeah, it'd be interesting to think about how the cements interact with with uh, hydrogen. And I guess the, the other, our other thinking too is that uh, you know you have the whole well, right? But as long as the hydrogen is going through a hydrogen resistant tubular, like the, you could do some stuff downhole without having to replace the casing. I guess. Right. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Actually, if I could jump in, I'd pick that with a, a question for um, Joanna. There's obviously so many pathways uh, in doing chemical transformations for energy, and you showed a lot of your work in the electrochemical space, um, given cer certainly interest on thermal processes as well as subsurface processes. I don't know, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening at SSRL these days, what's happening in your research group in terms of utilizing those tools for other types of chemistries? I know you've worked a lot in the battery space and sure, in the uh, yeah. electrochemical technology yeah. space. Yeah, so um, yeah, because we are focused on the x-rays, we have a, a broad range of materials that we're looking at. Um, we are focusing a lot on batteries, lithium ion batteries, moving towards sodium ion batteries, um, trying to take um, you know, hopeful battery technologies that could work for long duration storage in the battery space. Long duration really just means more than 10 hours, which isn't very much. Um, so I think I, I see this um, as, as really um, an opportunity. You really need to be able to, to um, optimize all of these storage technologies um, because batteries are not going to get us to, you know, months of storage, so it's nice to see that, that hydrogen storage can, can be um, sort of married to shorter duration storage with, um, with um, battery technology or flow cell batteries um, for, for grid storage. Um, so yeah, uh, we're working through the full space um, and... Um, Great. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Super. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, if there are any other questions out there. Yep. And then we'll, we'll have our panelists uh, make, give a final word is how we'll wrap up. So maybe one more question and then final word. Why don't you all think about that? Okay. Yes, please. Julia De Palma with Shell Hydrogen. Um, maybe just a more general question on how you partner with industry. So I know we all mentioned scaling up past lab demonstrations to pilots. Is there like a general Stanford guidance on when you would like, is, is it possible to do a pilot with Stanford, or are you really looking for industry at that point to help you with a pilot scale demonstration of your technology? Who would like to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can give my thoughts if, if I'm understanding the question correctly. The, the challenge for piloting any, first of all, everyone has a different definition of what pilot means, but. Um, uh, but the challenge for doing something on a more relevant scale than what we do the R&D on is an infrastructure challenge on the university campus. We are, uh, ex we meaning uh, actually a higher level than me in the university organization, exploring different level, you know, different options for can we create a space, you know, nearby dedicated to piloting, what would that, what would that take, what would that cost? Um, how do we utilize partnerships to make that? I, I think it's really interesting and there's great opportunities. That said, if you know, a shell or, or somebody else in, the, in that space already has existing infrastructure, then that's so much easier as long as we can just figure out how the relationship works to you know, send our students over there with some of our catalyst technology, for example, leveraging the process engineering and the infrastructure there. That model, Looks seems very attractive to me, but I know there is there has been a lot of talk and and some ideation around how do we create a, how could Stanford create a facility that would enable its researchers to easily scale? Because just in the research labs here, it it just isn't it just isn't feasible beyond you know beyond the lab scale for sort of building code reasons. I think it's a great question. If I could just add a thought, and I think we have an opportunity to create what that is. And if you think about, you know, everyone around the world looks at Stanford like, wow, it's like look at the tech and the impact. But if you really think about what sectors, Stanford and other institutions for that matter have had greatest success in academia turning it into like a real product that we might use every day, uh, there's software, right? Uh, there's biotech and biomedical things. Like these are certain industries, electronics. And if you think about the pathway of those types of technology, which are very high market value, and oftentimes very, in this case of software, very low cap X, it's a very different avenue, right? And, and for instance, we have a clean room here. So I like to use that as an example. Like a lot of universities have a clean room. So if somebody's got a really great idea on a new type of integrated circuit, a new type of fabrication process to make a really fast memory, 
you can actually go into the clean room at Stanford. You have a, a massive multi-million dollar facility that you can call almost like a pilot because it's using the same type of tools that are used in modern industry for manufacturing integrated circuits, test out your ideas, prototype things, and then if you know that that works, it, you know it'll work off campus, so to speak, at a, at a multi-billion dollar fab because the tools are, work very similarly. You know, we don't have that in the energy sector. And so it's really, I agree that it's really through partnership will give us kind of the fastest path, but what does that framework look like? And there are already success examples of that in different degrees and different areas, but we, I, I think if we could build that together, a more robust framework, I think that would be massively beneficial for all of us. Everybody, it's a win-win scenario. If I could add one. Please, Tony, thing. go yeah, for it. I'd say on the geological side, yeah, we're quite adept at working on, you know, fitting into teams working on pilot projects, you know, the, the, and, and I think adding a lot of value. You know, the only real consideration is that when a student or a Stanford researcher touches something, they have to be able to put it in their thesis, right? So that, that's actually usually the hardest part of getting involved in the pilot is sort of this, how are the results going to be presentable, you know, to the outside world? Yeah. Super. I would, can yes. I just add oh, yeah. one add, more thing about that. the partner? Yes. Uh, I would say some of the successful examples we've had at, at, at the National Lab at, at using the synchrotron is often um, a share of materials, looking at materials either um, as they're made, or, were they manufactured in the way that you think they were manufactured, um, or after use. Um, how was the degradation? Um, and so we have tools that are you know, not your standard lab tools that you would have available. And quickly adding that, uh, yeah, it works really well to have partnerships with um, industry and companies. We had a, a few examples where uh, maybe with sponsor research projects that are already going on with uh, Stanford, it's much easier than to get that piloting sort of like larger scale. And in general, in the chemical space, it's quite harder than sort of like hardware and also hard materials. Um, an example, I'm working now with Tiziana Vanorio uh, that I think spoke this morning, where scaling up a sustainable like green cement sort of like sample is a matter of like running it on a larger scale in first approximation and building something with it. When it g comes to the chemical reactors, right, scaling it up in the same way is not as simple as creating a larger formulation. So that's where the partnerships with external industry partners work really, really well. Okay, if I could transition and just give our panelists in one or two sentences briefly some final thoughts. Joanna, why don't we go down the line and start with you? Sure. Um, so I would just say that you know there's not one solution. I think we need to be really thinking about not what just you know how do we want the energy landscape to look like in 50 years, but what about tomorrow and in 10 years? And, and everybody needs to be working, I think, on, on all of those um, important questions. Mateo? I think it's an exciting time for energy in general. It's where I see there's lot, lots of ideas that can be um, pursued. And um, it's really an exciting time to be a part of this uh, new energy revolution. So, Excellent. Matt? Yeah, I, I would say that um, cheap hydrogen is the foundation for, at least, at least for for you know what, what I was talking about, what some of us were talking about today, if you can't, if we don't actually scale the production of cheap, low carbon hydrogen, then then um, sustainable fuels, I think, will always be very limited. Um, our job uh, as a research community, I think, is to create options of, or one way we can help is by creating things that you can do with hydrogen to very efficiently turn them into the products that we already touch and utilize on a daily basis that will help hopefully create the pull to scale the hydrogen to bring the cost down to make this all happen. Great. Tony. Yeah. So um, Tom mentioned the size of like the hydrogen market at, you know, in his opening comments. And, and I would say that, and similar to Matt's comment, right, that market is really limited by the availability of like cheap, inexpensive hydrogen, right? And so I'm super excited uh, to really see how the renewable infrastructure is growing on the generation side, right? Because uh, renewables are intermittent. Uh, and so uh, California, as I was showing, is a great example that basically the renewable infrastructure is oversized for many parts of the year. And I think that creates an opportunity of you know, a lot of electricity could be generated and could be moved because the grid is not you know, full on, again, days like today. Um, so I think there's a really nice synergy 
between the you know the build in renewable infrastructure, renewable energy infrastructure, and uh, hydrogen generation and storage. Great. And my last comment would be that uh, you know we th need to think about systems of systems and think at that level as well. Uh, unlike a lot of technologies that are in place today, like how aircraft fly, it's pretty much one type of technology that gets adopted all across aviation. But production of hydrogen in some regions, maybe uh, low-cost electricity means that electrolysis makes more sense. Other places have maybe low-cost natural gas, and maybe methane pyrolysis makes more sense. So we're going to have a patchwork of different systems out there, and we need to, and if that if they're going to succeed individually, we need to think about a way how they're interconnected so that we can lower the cost of that whole system of systems. So with that, I want to thank everybody for uh, your time with us today. I want to thank our panelists for their time and look forward to future discussions with all of you. Take care. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>